All right, so today I wanna to share a few tips on how you can maximize the number of ball python hatchlings that you produce every year if you're breeding ball pythons. And the first thing I wanna start with is the question of the day. I actually put out a video just the other day telling everyone, hey, I'm gonna separate my male and my female ball pythons for the last time this year. It's pretty much the end of the pairing season. And I actually had a couple of people chime in and say, hey, about a month ago, you actually did another video where you ultrasounded some of your females and some of those females had follicles immature eggs that were about 10 millimeters or 15 millimeters and typically that's when you start pairing your males and your females when the female follicles are about 10 millimeters and some of you guys are noticing hey you're definitely not maximizing the production of ball python hatchlings here in my collection and I actually made a list of seven tips I wanted to share if I was to actually kind of change everything around and maximize the number of hatchlings that I produced here in my collection. And the number one thing on my list, I would actually switch from kind of a seasonal breeding to a year-round breeding season. So the way I pretty much have it set up right now is I actually pair up all my males and my females on October 15th. I actually just kind of set a hard fast date right at the end of the year in mid-October. And I start pairing up everything that's pretty much of size that's actually able to breed and it's real in really good shape. It's eating really well. This year I actually paired up a couple of females that were kind of stubborn feeders and it seemed like pairing them up kind of stimulated the feeding, which is kind of interesting. But here is kind of the kicker for that whole thing as far as like a seasonal breeding season. What you'll actually do is you'll start pairing up your males and your females and as you progress through the year, different females will actually develop follicles faster than other ones. So when I actually looked at all my females about a month ago, there were pretty much all over the board. Some of them had really big follicles, like 30 millimeters plus, and some of them were like a 10 millimeters and 15 millimeters. It was kind of like all over the place. And kind of the problem with the seasonal breeding, say for example, if I actually kept pairing up right now, what would actually happen is if I paired up for another month or two, the end of the season would kind of drag out further into the fall. I was actually looking back at some of my breeding schedules and some of the, 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 as the dates where I actually got the eggs from the ball pythons. And it's kind of interesting, looking back at some of the records, you definitely want to keep records as far as what's going on in your collection because it can get kind of complicated. But as far as my eggs, it seems like I got eggs anywhere from the middle of March to the middle of May as far as my very first eggs. So there's quite a big stretch there. And when I stop pairing in the middle of March, I would actually get eggs sometimes all the way in August, like the middle of August. And if I actually intend to breed those females again in October, that means I have August, September, October, I have two months to get some rats into those females to get them back up into condition to breed them the following year. So sometimes you're actually kind of chasing, you know, the females and the whole kind of, you know, it can be really confusing as far as doing a seasonal approach. So if I was actually to switch to a year round approach, what I would actually do is I would look at every single female individually and then when their follicles hit 10 millimeters, that's when I would pair them up. As a matter of fact, I've actually seen a lot of big breeders where they'll do the, the kind of the ultrasound follicle method and they'll you actually look at the racks and they have a color code system for the follicle size for the females and they will breed year round and you could definitely be more productive if you do a year round breeding season. But, but kind of the, on the flip side, it's a lot more work. You don't really have an off season where you don't have eggs and hatchlings. And kind of the big thing up here in the mountains of Colorado, it gets really super cold in the winter. We have really long winters where you really can't ship ball pythons. So if I actually got hatchlings in like November or December, I'd probably be sitting on those hatchlings pretty much all winter long until the spring until I can actually ship those hatchlings. But let me tell you, if I went to a year-round breeding season, I could definitely increase the production of hatchlings here in my reptile room. 
Oh, so, so number two on my list is you'd ultrasound all females weekly. Let me tell you, I've actually seen some people that are just kind of obsessed over uh, ultrasounding all their females. And let me tell you, if you want to increase the production of hatchlings, you definitely want to ultrasound on a regular basis. And I've actually seen some people with the ultrasound every single female every week and kind of mark it on the tub as far as the follicle size. And as soon as it hits a certain size, they'll start pairing out males with that females and it can get pretty complicated if you don't have a really good system as far as keeping track of all the follicle size and who's breeding who the other thing it gets a little bit confusing so for example if you're actually breeding your males you know part of the year and then another female is ready later in the year and that male's already been through some of the females sometimes the males I would imagine could get a little bit worn out breeding too many females too spread apart it get, it get a little bit confusing as far as all right this female's ready but this male has already been breeding for three months then we need to give the male a break before i can breed it with the female so technically you may actually need more males on a year-round breeding season which would be kind of an interesting dilemma i've never actually tried a year-round breeding season but i think i could definitely be more productive all right, so number three, if you actually wanted to be more productive in your reptile room, you would hold back a lot of hatchlings. And here in, as a matter of fact, when I first started breeding ball pythons, I was holding back a whole bunch. It seems like every year I have all these amazing hatchlings and I'll put hold back, hold back, hold back, and I'll get to the pretty much the end of the season, I'll have like a dozen or 15 holdbacks. And then I realize here in my reptile room, I don't really have that much room. So what I've decided is I've decided to pretty much keep it small here in my reptile room. I actually have a room that's about 200 square feet here in my reptile room and I don't really want to expand but beyond this this small reptile room here in the basement of my house it's just a really I'd say I'm kind of like a hobbyist breeder just breeding a few snakes here in my basement <laughs> I guess you could say I have room for maybe about 150 I think it's like 155 tubs here in my reptile room if you actually take into consideration all my hatchling racks and everything. I have room for I'd say maybe about 60 or 70 breeders here in my reptile room and that let me tell you that is definitely enough to keep me busy pretty much most of the year. All right, so number four, you would potentially have to rent a warehouse if you actually really expanded. So, so if you actually did year-round breeding, you got a whole bunch of hatchlings, and you decided to hold back a lot of hatchlings. Say I was actually holding back, you know, like 12 or 15 snakes every single year, I would definitely outgrow this room. And what I would do is, if I got to that point, what I'd do is I'd move into like a kind of a rented space or a warehouse or something like that. And as far as a location, if you're actually thinking about doing this what I would actually do is I'd find like a little warehouse or a little spot to rent that's close to a FedEx preferably a FedEx that's closest to the airport so that's kind of the other dilemma for me up here in my house is like the closest FedEx that goes directly to the airport is an hour drive from my house I actually have to drive all the way down the mountain to the FedEx it's an hour one way to drop off my snake and an hour back so it's a two hour round trip just to drop off the snakes so what I would actually do if I expanded into a bigger business I would pick a spot that was right next to a FedEx that went directly to the airport that way if you're shipping snakes you could just walk right across the street and deliver it at the FedEx which would be one of the things you should consider if you're thinking about expanding your collection all right, so number five, if you actually did go down this road, you held back a lot of hatchlings, you expanded into a warehouse. Number five, you would have to buy some equipment. You'd have to buy more racks and you'd have to potentially buy more incubators to expand your business. Well, keep in mind, the more females you have, the more hatchlings that you'll actually have in the end. And I kind of ran up against the wall this year. I actually had an abundance of females and not enough males to go around to my females. As a matter of fact, this year, I actually held back two males because I don't have enough males to service all my females and I pretty much limit my males to service just four females I just breed them with four females pretty much do like a, like three days with one female three days with another and then I'll give them a little break for like a week or a week and a half and then I'll work them pretty much through two more females three days at a time that's been my schedule here in my reptile room 
All right, so number six, don't forget if you're actually expanding, you wanna increase the number of hatchlings and you hold back your hatchlings, expand into our warehouse, buy a bunch of equipment. What you'll probably need is you'll actually have to hire employees. And it's kind of interesting going down this road. You don't really wrap your head around it until you sit down and scratch it out on paper. You know, it's kind of interesting. You start breeding ball pythons, you get all these hatchlings and you're like, all right, I wanna hold back 20 hatchlings. And then you start running out of room and then you move into an office space and then you have to buy equipment and then you have to hire employees and it's just like a lot of kind of a lot of overhead once you get into it there's a lot of potential to make a lot of money but let me tell you you can definitely have a lot of overhead so that's another thing you have to consider is you'll probably have to hire employees so number seven the other thing that I would definitely change if I actually went down this road and actually so so pretty much what you actually have down at the end you'd actually have you know, a lot of overhead you'd have to be paying rent for the warehouse you'd have to be paying salaries for the employees I've actually seen some people do this where they start producing a lot of ball pythons and have a lot of overhead in these big facilities with a lot of employees and then what it comes down to is pretty much you're making your money from the eggs then the eggs are coming from the females and you're depending on your females to lay those eggs so what I would actually do for number seven is I would tend to feed more live rodents and I've actually seen some bigger breeders actually talking about this on some of their YouTube videos where they're like, all right, so no matter what, we need this female to breed one way or the other. And what they'll actually do is not only will they feed live rats, but they'll also try other live rodents like live African softwares or sometimes even live mice to get those females to breed. Because keep in mind the, you know, kind of the success of their business to pay all the bills, they need those females to breed. It's a little bit bit uh, too high pressure for me to actually go down that road and have a lot of overhead and a really big business and you know I'm depending on my females to eat. Let me tell you ball pythons can be pretty finicky when it comes to eating. So here in my collection what I do is I just attempt to feed my ball pythons every week and if they don't it's no big deal and I kind of you know I'm kind of kind of a hobby breeder. I don't really you know depend on this as a source of income my sole source of income to pay all my bills. As a matter of fact most of my my money actually comes from YouTube and a lot of the online things that I'm doing on the internet and that's kind of more of the direction that I want to go eventually instead of you know mainly focusing on my ball pythons I'll probably keep it to just the small little room here and keep it to where I'm just seasonally breeding I have my off seasons and my seasons where I'm collecting eggs you know another season where I'm doing all the egg cutting and then just doing the YouTube videos so it really depends on what you're doing but I would say if I wanted to you know if I wanted to keep it small and maximize the production here in my reptile room probably what I would do is I would switch to year-round breeding I would switch to ultrasounding all my females every single week and I probably wouldn't hold back hatchlings or rent a warehouse or buy any more equipment or hire employees I might actually go to feeding more live rodents in my collection here to try to get all my bull pythons to eat if I was actually looking to increase the production of my hatchlings and keep my business pretty small so that is pretty much it. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next video.